I don't know if it's all working, but it is. Um, I mean, I guess as a starting point, it kind of feels a bit fraudulent standing in front of you guys. Normally, when I talk to a large group of people, they know very little about technology, and so my ignorance is, is hidden, if you like, by, by their greater ignorance. And I'm acutely aware, as I said earlier today, that, that I'm in the unfortunate position of being the least well-informed person in the room. So I, I beg your forgiveness, and hopefully the story that I'll talk you through is more about how we see it from the business side, and what it means to our, our organizations, and what open means to, to local authorities. So I'm not just going to talk about the Triborough, which is um, Hammersmith and Fulham out in the west, Kensington and Chelsea a little bit further to the east, and Westminster Bang in the centre of London. I'm going to try and talk a little bit about what it means for us as a sector and why I think it's so important that we think about it. Um, so as I talk through that, um, I guess there's a few little things I'll pick up on. I'll talk about the three councils a little bit, give you some introduction to how Genesis, how we come together, what that means in terms of the internal challenge. I'll talk about the wider context in local government and what's happening in the public sector and why it really matters for us. And then I'll give you a little bit of um, some context around what I think that means we need to what we need to do and why I think it's so important. And hopefully bring it all back together again with the, some of the stuff that we're doing in, in Triborough and why it's so important that what you're doing carries on being done. If that makes sense. So the three boroughs, they're three in the, in the London boroughs. They're very, very small in terms of footprint. So for anyone who knows the London geography, three quite densely packed. We've got the fourth and the second smallest boroughs in London in, in the tri-borough. Um, but we make a huge impact. 2% of the UK GDP is generated in Westminster, and there are over a million daily occupants in Westminster. A million people visit the borough. So really, really small geography, really, really big impact. Um, in 2011, the, the three chief executives across the three councils came together and, and produced a proposal called Bold Ideas for Challenging Times, which was their response to the age of austerity. So for anyone who's not involved in, in central or local government, you'll be aware that we've seen huge, huge financial challenges with local government budgets being slashed by 40, 50 or 60 percent. So we had to work differently. And a key proposition that Triborough picked up on is that by working together, which resonates with some of the earlier conversations I got to listen to today, by working together, we can hopefully do it cheaper, but most importantly, we can hopefully also do it better. So there's a real belief that by developing shared services, by working in partnership and collaboratively, we can achieve those, those almost contradictory objectives and outcomes. What's quite interesting when you look at Triborough, in terms of its evolution, it's been allowed to happen organically. Unlike private organizations where one organization can take over another, in the public sector there's a political mandate, so it's important to protect political sovereignty. So we have three sovereign organizations with three cabinets, three sets of councillors, each of whom have a democratically elected right to exercise choice. So we didn't simply take over two of the councils from one, we came together and it's evolved organically over time. So I, I'm not, there is a slide that we have in our standard decks that talks about some of that complexity, I'm, I'm not going to befuddle you with it, but in essence there are triborough services, adults and children are a great example, so all of the social care in the three councils is triborough, and all three councils work together. There are biborough services where only two of the three councils work together, um, and there are examples of street care and, and refuse collection and commercial waste. And then there are sovereign monoborough services where each borough operates on its own. And even in some of the triborough services, like libraries, we like to have a different feel to what the library does for Westminster users as against Kensington and Chelsea users. So it's really, really complex when you look at that political landscape and you look at that organisational landscape. In terms of that though, as uh, I'm relatively new in the job, I've, I've been in the role for just over a year, um, I've tried to distill down what really matters to the organisation, and this slide tries to set that out. I, I guess there is this thing about cost, saving money is critical, there is this thing about improving the way we do stuff, the way we work together, so collaboration, communication, um, enabling innovation within services, so enabling the organisations to do stuff differently than the way they've done it before. And if you've ever worked with a public sector organisation, that, that can be quite hard, because a lot of what's done 
It's almost cooked into the DNA of the organization. And the cultures of necessity are risk averse, not risk embracing. So there's a huge challenge that, in many ways, the finances have almost provided us with a, a catalyst to make a change. Um, so that context starts to come together in a way that's meaningful. So we know that we need to work together to realize those bold ideas, to work as one. We know that we need to deliver better services because there's an increasingly aging population who are increasingly in need of social care and support through their later years. And we know that <clears throat> we need to save money. And I think all of that is a real challenge and there isn't a single view on how that's done. So even within one of the political parties, even within one of the councils, there is disagreement. And our challenge is how we bring that together. <coughs> so what has all of that got to do with open? Um, what, what is open in our world? And I think it means different, pe different things to different people, um, which is both a strength and a weakness. It means we don't have a single view of what we're going to. But actually not having a single here where we're going to is really powerful. Because if we did, it's not going to be everyone's idea. Whereas by being different, it can be everyone's idea. And we need to change some of the perceptions. So politically, people often latch on to the open means free. And whether that's open source, whether that's open data, whether that's um, open standards. And it really isn't. And when you're delivering large-scale enterprise IT, and the tri is about 10,000 users across about 300 sites, um, with many, many terabytes of data, I think almost 100 terabytes of data, nothing's ever going to be free. So we have some real challenges in how we get to a place where people understand open and understand that it isn't simply about free, because that's their perception. So what we're starting to see evolve within the organization is an understanding of open that says it's about making more of our information available and open by default. And that's a huge cultural shift. Um, it used to be the case that we secured every bit of data we had, and we only shared the stuff that we had to share. And then the Freedom of Information Act came along, and it turned out to be a lot easier to share more of our data and only secure the stuff that has to be secured because it's about people or commercially sensitive stuff. And that duality, if you like, of openness but also of commercial common sense has made this notion of open data and open by default something that we're starting to get both political and executive traction around. We're also starting to learn the benefits of collaborative working and, and it wasn't that long ago that in, in probably 2005 as part of the e-government agenda when councils competed to have the best council website. Um, and Socketum ran, I think still run, um, Socketum's a society of IT managers for local government, uh, a competition where you know, one council could be better at, other, at building a website than other councils. What we're starting to see now, both through the Gov UK work, but also through tighter collaboration across councils, is an increasingly common platform and a common approach to building their digital platforms, whatever that may be, whether it's apps or websites or whatever it is. And so that collaborative culture that I think people have spoken about this morning, and certainly one or two of the speakers I heard did, is absolutely starting to become part of our DNA. So open source, if you like, is the second part of what open means in our space. The third one, and probably the one that I think is least well evolved, and, and certainly with a lot of our suppliers, is very much in its infancy is this notion of standards and the ability to exchange stuff and have open standards where we can share and freely share data across different systems. A lot of our systems are legacy. If you look at the three councils, we have hundreds and hundreds of systems. At the moment, we, we've spent the last three years trying to rationalize our key line of business system, but I still have two systems delivering children's care and finally one delivering adult care, but they don't talk to each other. And we all know that children become adults. So a lot of data has to be moved through the process, has to be moved through the organization. And we don't have those standards yet for our vendors, many of whom have proprietary APIs if they have any. And if they do, we want to charge them an arm and a leg every time we want to use, implement, or modify them. So I think we're starting to gain an appreciation that the next part of our journey has to be around open standards and how we can glue together the systems that we have internally 
to allow us to continue to achieve and realize those bold ideas, to work to deliver savings and better services within the three councils. The same is true when we talk about partners. So we increasingly work with health, we increasingly work with the police, and we increasingly need to share data with them. And I think that mentality, that mindset, has to stretch across the public, so, uh, the public sector. So open is a mindset, and I think it's the solution that we're looking for. I think it's the thing that allows us to unblock some of the challenges that the, private, the public sector faces. It allows us to make more data-driven um, decisions around service delivery. It allows us to welcome in the armchair auditors to better understand services and how services relate to one another and how consumption of those services is interconnected. Something that we can't do, we don't have the skills, something that we don't have the resources to do, it's something that there is actually huge interest in doing within our communities. People love our data. And so our ability to share it will really inform and change the way in which we can deliver our services. Allowing us to adapt our systems to local needs, again, is, is really quite key. We all, I think, see an increasing de devolution with people wanting to take local decisions in their space, in their geography. We, will, we make economies of scale through large shared systems, but only by customizing and tweaking, nuancing them for a location can we start to make better local, um, provide better systems and solutions to local needs. And finally, I think the ability to share and collaborate is that really key one. And I think this is the one that is most challenging for us in my view now. So back to Triborough. Um, I think open standards are the next step. I think deep integration, where we integrate not just the technology, but actually the data, the processes, and understand the, an ability to do things differently, is where we'll start to realize more efficiencies, make better savings, and enable better service delivery. We're starting to use Drupal. I think it's, it's um, one of the projects that's probably most interesting as we look at um, Triborough portfolio, the stuff where we're doing stuff together. Um, but because technically, I think the challenge is a much easier one. And this is probably the kind of comment I shouldn't make in this type of room or to this type of audience, but I will anyway. I suspect the technology is the easy part of the problem. And the really hard part of the problem is the bit that I've written up as culture, but it actually is sovereignty. Each of the comms teams thinks it really matters what platform they choose. And yet when I talk to some of our service users, the people who deliver services to children or to adults or libraries, the thing that they think really matters is being able to have one platform that they can understand, one platform where they can input their content, and one platform that delivers it appropriately to whichever target audience is looking at it. And that tension between the people who take the decisions around how we move stuff forward, the people who have to use it, and the people that we serve, is absolutely tied into all that. And I think that's part of the myth that we have to bust around what open means. People need to see it as being a route to flexibility and agility and, and choice, not free. And I think that journey is, is starting, but not quite there. <laughs> So we need to further integrate our systems across the shared services in Triborough, and we need to continue to do that with our partners. Um, and if there's one thing I can very cheaply do, it would be to ask that that's something we think about. I think it's a really hard message to sell internally, and it's a really hard message to sell when organizations are faced by hundreds of suppliers, each of whom sings and celebrates the uniqueness of their product, or their standard, or their API, or their code, and actually, all of those nuances, all of those uniquenesses, are of course a value. And I wouldn't want to say that the only way is this or that or the other. What I do want to say is the, the ability to integrate and maintain those integrations, to keep the data and the processes aligned and interoperating, is the key. And if we can be open there, choice elsewhere is kind of OK, and I could probably live with it. And I think you guys and communities like this are key in influencing that change. I think you can drive that change. You can drive a change in the way the market responds. And that would be my call to arms, if I may. So I know I'm between you and lunch, um, an enviable spot. Um, that's as much as I had set out to share with you, but I'm obviously very happy to take any questions or talk 
about anything that you'd like to pick up on. The trial of one of the Boris says, is it very idea in certain areas? Is it new in London or the UK or the UK or is it other places? So it's, I mean, it dates back to 2011 and was formally started in 2012, uh, the tri It was, I think, one of the first of its kind. There are a couple since, so Kingston, Sutton, and London also operates as a shared service. Sorry, um, I didn't get. And there are a, a few others um, across the country. So it's starting more and more. I think. And I think there's a growing aspiration to do that shared service more widely, albeit perhaps in, in service silence <coughs> rather than entire councils. The politics makes it very interesting. Though. Every time an administration changes, there's a whole lot of stakeholder changes which can be challenging. Yes. Is it a, a legal framework or is it contracting by one of the three models? There are loads of different models. Um, so the, the Local Government Act has, <coughs> I think, I'm not a lawyer, but I think has two ways in which you can do it within that act. So if you remain a public body, you can either use section 113, which is where you share staff across the three, and there's cost transparency, or you can use section 101, which is a bit like um, two key arrangements, where you effectively have a host borough, and resources are transferred to that borough and costed out to the others but then you can use community interest companies or, <coughs> or any one of a number of different um, delivery vehicles. You um, touched on the complexity for uh, potential clients selecting a good service provider. Um, has the G-Cloud framework helped you in any way, shape or form? <laughs> Um, very political question, ironically. Um, <laughs> totally. So I think G Cloud is uh, a fantastic way of enabling um, public sector organisations to contract quickly and easily, especially if you think you're going to be buying something big that crosses the OG level. What's interesting, though, is you do get back to that issue of sovereignty, and, and a lot of councils like to think that their need is unique. And, and the second you're in a place where you think you have a unique need, you have to write a specification, and you have to go to market, and you have to tender. So there is a culture change. There's a journey that we, we are continuing to go on. Um, I think there is increasing support for G-Cloud, so I, I know I'm not alone. Um, probably not in the majority in London yet, but, but not in a tiny minority either. So I think it's changing, and I think G-Cloud is absolutely, um, or frameworks like G-Cloud, absolutely the way forward. Context of like um, people that have gone through the same journey outside of the UK. Um, are you interested in that kind of context? Or? Um, I would be really, really interested. Um, I think it, it's such a. So, my, my background is in all um, public sector, and I've, I've been involved in some mergers and acquisitions in the private sector which is in many ways much, much simpler. <laughs> um, more brutal, but much, much simpler. So I would really welcome any, any contacts you have, that would be fantastic. Um, in Netherlands, there's quite a lot of action happening, in, in, like in the Drupal scene. Also in Belgium, I know there's, um, there's at least one like, larger group outside. That would be fantastic, thank you. I just wanted to know, you, you made like a sharing code base beyond Triboro easier. Because I've been working in a council project a couple of years ago, and as you were saying, the analysis is still the same. Everybody thinks that the need is unique, whereas basically we've got a lot of details in councils across, across UK and they have the same needs. How do you think you could make that going slightly Okay, so the question is, um, how can we make the sharing of uh, code base, I guess, easier, more widely across local government or government generally than just the triborough? Um, I mean, I think there are two answers. So Gov UK have a, um, a, a kind of really helpful website and, and specification design, I guess, I don't know what the right word is, around how you can build great public sector websites. And I think if you look at a lot of the new London websites, most are to some degree based on that design. I think that that will be helpful, but even in the Triborough, the three councils have adopted different approaches to implementing that design. So they've not done it vanilla, so to speak. I think the way we can encourage some of that vanilla is by building relationships. 
So certainly when I worked in Lambeth, um, Lambeth used a group called Good For Nothing to help the council build this website, um, which was fantastic. It was a really, really useful way of starting to engage in a process that was all about doing things in a different way, with a different mindset. And I guess that mindset word is key. I have contacts in Camden, in Islington, in Ealing, and I talk about that. And when I said earlier on, there's a call to arms, I think that's part of it. I think if, if you and people like you can refer to those projects, to those successes where we protected sovereignty, but understood what can be standard, we start to slowly step forward. And I think it's a bit like a snowball. Once it gets going, it will really exponentially grow out. So I think it's word of mouth, to be honest. I think if you let it become over-bureaucratized, it will become impossible and unmanageable, and no one will do it. Whereas if we allow it to grow from grassroots, I think it will flour uh, flourish. Any more questions? I might open it up just to make sure people can cover it too. Michael, sorry to surprise you, yep. but whilst we've got five minutes, if anyone had any questions around Michael's topic as well, we've got five minutes before lunch, or also any more for Ed. Any more queries for the speakers from the last section? Just wonder if you could give a little bit more detail about sort of where you're at in terms of <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a hard question to answer. So, um, Westminster site has gone live and went live uh, a good few months ago. Um, we're kind of having some of the discussions around exactly what is commoditizable, exactly what can be standard, and exactly where things can differ. Kensington have done a huge amount of work, and, and we're very hopeful that their website will go back, will go live on a common code base um, just before the summer. And Hammersmith are about six months behind that, so I'm hopeful that by end of 2015, all three sites will have gone live on a common code base um, that's Drupal based. We're doing our best to see if we can move them to shared hosting at the same time. So. Uh, and this is again my technology weakness, but in my head I think if we allow the three sites to be hosted in different places, there's a high likelihood that they will start to differentiate. So by forcing them to host together, it kind of feels like a control that I can put on people who will want to be unique and different and special and make that a little bit harder for them. So we're trying to get the hosting sorted out as a parallel activity, if you like, to the development of the Kensington and Hansen sites. But I don't know if that's the right answer. <laughs> Basically, in this year, all three should be live, common code base, and common hosting. I'm going to touch some wood. <laughs> so you stated that one of the primary aims of or the reasons that the corporation source were is to achieve some economy um, that's been trust upon you uh, from government. And where do you see the greatest benefit um, beyond the code itself. Are you finding that perhaps uh, you know, using consistent systems is producing training overhead and perhaps infrastructure? I, I, I guess just I'll, if I do a quick route, look across the room, as long as there are no finance people here, I, I don't think saving money in IT is the right answer. So, so my starting point is I have very much defended IT spend and IT budgets. Uh, in the wrong place to say we need to do stuff better, which means using more technology. If I'm honest, I don't think it's a, um, a technical belief that says um, standardization is best or common code base is best. I actually think it is the value. So I like to think not of the cost, but rather of the value. And the biggest value for me is probably is described in things like reduced training or simpler to use, user experience type stuff. But actually, I think a lot of it is, is, is really basic. It, it's having a common process. If, if you're a social worker you know, who's out and about every day visiting um, your clients, the last thing you want to do in the evening is go and have to update three websites with the latest change in process. You, know, you, you don't want to do it at all. And if we in IT can make it possible for you to just do it once, and then it automatically goes where it needs to go, we, we've made a difference to your life, and through that, to all the people who consume it children's social care services lives. That's where I think we have value, and that's why I think we do it. So you think that it was often better services? Totally, totally. 
better services, better information to inform better redesign, more better services, if that makes sense. It becomes virtuous, which is why I reference open as a philosophy, as a mindset, rather than just open source, because I think we're not very good at using data to make data-driven decisions in local authorities. We're pulled in millions of directions, um, not just all of our citizens, but central government departments. Everyone pulls local authorities to do different things. And we have a culture of therefore being quite reactive to that. I think by opening up our data and using it to inform our decision making, we become much better at actually solving real problems rather than reacting to individuals' perceptions of them. And I think that's valuable. On that. Okay. Uh, just one quickie. Is some of this going up to Boris? <laughs> <laughs> some of it is, yeah. So Boris is, um, I, I think, I'm not I'm speaking the mayor of for anybody who's not. Yeah. Um, I think Boris has um, cited that some of the tri-borough working arrangements as um, the way forward, if you like. Certainly, all of the political parties, whenever they've had an opportunity to align with one of the three boroughs, celebrates the approach. So I think it's recognised nationally as well as local. I think on the note of um, better services via open mentality and open technology would be a very nice place to pause. So thank you very much, Sweat.